Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to this week's edition of Business in Hawaii. I'm Daylan Yanagita. We're broadcasting live from the Think Tech studios in Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. If you want to tune in live, we're at www.thinktechhawaii.com. And you may also subscribe to our programs and get on our mailing list at that site as well. The theme of Business in Hawaii is to share with you stories of local businesses in Hawaii by local Hawaii people. Our guests share with us how they were able to build successes in our challenging business environment. We are pleased today to have Valerie Wang to the ThinkTech studios. Valerie is the president of Makai HR, a startup business that recently launched in Hawaii. Valerie, thanks for joining us and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So congratulations on the new business. Thank you very much. Let's hear about what Makai HR is. Yeah, so Makai HR is a professional employer organization, acronym PEO. Um, and what we basically do is we do HR outsourcing for small to me medium-sized businesses. Uh, when you look at a small to medium-sized business, there's a lot of tough business decisions that the business owner has to make. Um, and HR shouldn't be one of them, although HR usually is, is the most complex piece because it's, you're dealing with state and federal law. Uh, so companies like Makai HR are able to offer payroll, work comp, and benefit services to help support the day-to-day -day, um, jobs and work that the business owners are doing so that they can focus on their actual business and what they want to build. Very nice. So tell me how you got involved with Makai. I understand that's a, that's a big story. Yeah, so I'm a transplant. I moved to Hawaii at the beginning of this year to join the Makai HR team. Um, to t let's take a couple steps back and actually talk about the Makai story. So we were founded by Dustin Sellers. Um, some of you may know him from his time at Pro Service. So he was at another PE on the island uh, for a number of years and, and really helped build that company to where they are today. Um, he took some time off to focus on some personal matters and then ended up back in the Hawaii business world with Koa Capital. Uh, one of the you know, true core values of Dustin and his story is to support small businesses in Hawaii and to create managerial opportunities and management opportunities for local residents in Hawaii uh, to keep talent here on the island and to also attract talent from the mainland to Hawaii. So Koa Capital was founded and, and their purpose was to really find and identify strong businesses in the community um, that had the potential for a lot of growth, and, and that's what they did. So Dustin and his partner, Chris Eldridge, um, really focused on looking at different industries and identifying key sectors where they could make a difference. And when you look at their portfolio companies, you can see some of the impact that they've had on the community here. Um, and so that's, you know, Dustin's focus for a while after he had left ProService was to get back to his roots and focus on the small business community in Hawaii. and create job opportunities and management, particularly management and equity management positions for local residents. Um, fast forward a couple years, you know, he was really looking at the HR industry and, and was looking at what happened on the mainland and the changes that happened. Um, and a lot of the things that he dreamt of building for the communities in Hawaii, um, but couldn't do because technology just wasn't there yet, he saw that happening on the mainland uh, with some of the new tech companies that had launched. Um, so he spoke with a, a bunch of his friends and advisors and realized that this was a great opportunity and time to you know, get back in the world of, of HR and PEO and have this great chance and opportunity to kick off uh, new technology in the HR space here in Hawaii. The way I got involved, um, so I've been in small businesses my whole life. My whole family is, is a family of entrepreneurship. So, you know, my dad ran his own business since 1990, and we've been through the ups and downs of, you know, being the family supporting that that lifestyle and career. Um, and so, you know, after I worked at a couple of, of jobs after, out of college, I also took a stab at small businesses. Uh, started my own company in 2013. Um, went to another startup business a couple years later. Um, at that startup business, I met a really good friend of mine, uh, Sean Montgomery, who soon became one of my mentors. And he's really guided me um, and made me the business person that I am today. 
Sean, turns out, used to work with Dustin many moons ago when Dustin was at the marketing agency. Um, and, you know, so Sean and I got to know each other for a very long time and, and quite well and spent years working together in the startup world. Uh, I left that company to go to a PEO um, and honestly had no idea what PEO meant or what it stood for. Uh, but that PEO had actually pitched me when I was working for the startup, their services. So I understood a little bit about the value of PEO because everything that, that they were pitching me that they would do, I had no idea and didn't understand. And, and they introduced me to this whole new world of compliance, which I should have known uh, being a part of that executive team of that startup business, but really had no idea. Um, my favorite part was I did not know what workers' comp insurance was, and I had no idea whether or not we had it. So. That was a fun eye-opening conversation. Um, so I, I ended up, you know, it went from a sales pitch to a job interview, and I ended up at another PEO on the mainland for a couple years. And when Dustin decided to get back in this world, he was, you know, talking story with his friends, and Sean told him he had, you know, he had someone on the mainland to talk to, and. You know, Dustin is Dustin, and and convinced me, and and really didn't have, actually have to do much convincing, but showed me what he was working on in his vision, um, and it, it lined up with a lot of the things I wish I could have done in my last role, and so it was the perfect storm. Everything lined up, and I ended up moving out here, you know, really quickly, about a month after we first connected, um, to join the team at Mackay and to help build what we hope will be a really special tool for the small business community here. Fantastic. Um, so you said you're a transplant. Um, so you moved here from California, and we know in Hawaii that the small business market is very challenging um, for, for businesses, local people. What has your experience been like being that transplant, being from California and working on a startup? Absolutely. So I think when you look at the Hawaii business community, something you learn very quickly is how close this community is. And when they say it's a small island, they really mean it's a small <laughs> island. And everyone knows everyone. And and relationships are not just business deep, right? Kids play on the same team together. Business owners went to high school together. And by high school, I also mean middle school and elementary school. So it's a very close-knit community. And I think you can either view that as a huge obstacle and challenge, being a transplant, obviously not having gone to high school here, um, not having kids that play soccer with, with the other kids on the island here. Um, you can view that as, as a huge challenge or I think as a blessing and an opportunity because once you can actually get into that community, it's really easy to, to, to be a part of that family rather than another community where it's more fragmented and not as close. You know, it's little relationships that you have to make one at a time, and, and it takes a lot longer to be a part of that ecosystem. Um, with that said, I've actually found the community here to be extremely warm. I feel like Hawaii has made me genuinely a nicer person um, and a calmer person uh, when it comes to stress level and, and deadlines and, and the timings of things. And, and so even though starting a, a new business can be quite stressful and uh, a lot of work and a lot of hours, it's with really incredible people. Um, and everyone I've met in my time here, not just our team, but and not just clients and, and friends of clients, but our business partners and businesses that may not even be partners, but genuinely have a vested interest in our success. I mean, it's been the most warm, I guess, landscape to really launch a business in because people genuinely care and you can trust that they have your best interests at heart. Um, and that's how I've, I've always tried doing my business in the past. And so it's, you know, when, I, when I'm asked my greatest flaw, what my greatest flaw is, I, I normally answer, I think I trust too much um, and I think I'm too honest. Um, and on the mainland, that has bit me in the butt because people have taken advantage of of my honesty and my candor. Um, but I don't think that's the case here. At least I haven't found that to be the case here. So all good things. Um, and I definitely think for anyone that's looking to start a business, starting a business in a community where the community genuinely cares is a great place. Having been born and raised in Hawaii, I 
I know how fortunate we are that we, we are people of Hawaii and that we have the warmth and the heart for one another before all the, all the business stuff. But with the experience that you have in startups, um, share with our viewers, what does it take? What's the first steps in starting up a business? Yeah, so I think there's, there's a, a lot of people with a lot of great ideas. The challenge is actually taking that leap of faith you know, leaving a very steady nine to five job and putting all of your time and effort into this idea that you believe in. Um, so I think there's a couple things, you know, before you start a business, is your idea something that you're so passionate about that you're willing to give up everything for it? Because starting a business is not easy. Um, there's a lot of sacrifices that have to be made and a lot of risk that you're taking. Um, and you. You don't want to do that for an idea that you don't wholeheartedly believe in and you're willing to put your heart and soul into that concept. So that would be the first first step, obviously. You know, not everyone's cut out to be, um, not everyone wants to take that risk and not everyone's comfortable with taking that risk. So just having that open dialogue with yourself and, and if risk isn't necessarily part of your profile, you know, maybe it's partnering with someone else that is a little bit riskier to kind of hedge that risk with you. So. Step one, obviously, what is your idea? Uh, step two, vet your idea. I'm, I've had plenty of ideas that I thought were the best idea in the world, and it turns out the rest of America doesn't agree. And if, if people don't agree, you know, it, don't necessarily change your idea, but listen to why and, and the feedback. And there's a lot of gems and nuggets in there that can actually make your idea better. Once you've vetted out your idea, I think the next step is to really evaluate what you need to execute. So, you know, most people will start with a business plan, and I think that's really smart for first time business owners or startup entrepreneurs because it really lays out the foundation of what you need to do, whether, you know, from putting together a budget, which will help you determine not just how much money you need to raise, but also how you want to raise the money, um, months to profitability. And, and everyone you talk to is going to say, you know, this is a shot in the dark, right? You can't really guess what your business is gonna look like, but it, it gives you a good framework of what you should work towards and what you can expect. Um, doing a market analysis, so who's your target market, and then what's your STP strategy, and how, who are you talking to, how are you talking to, and then doing and collecting data research to make sure that there's a fit between your product or your service and the market you're targeting. Um, because if there is no fit, you, you're setting yourself up for failure before you even begin. Um, so coming up with your plan and your strategy, vetting your idea, and then once those two pieces are done, um, now it's time time to actually launch your business. And before you get to all the fun stuff, it's all the, the boring legal stuff, right? What type of corporate structure do you want? And a lot of that is determined by how are you fundraising um, and funding your company. Then it's filing that, all of that paperwork. Um, getting your URL domain, getting all of your, you know, your GET license and things like that. So there's a lot of little things where I think as a first-time entrepreneur, you know, 15, 20 years ago, a lot of people had to do it on their own or spend thousands of dollars hiring the right people to do it. Fortunately now, you know, I believe that, that today we support small businesses more than we've ever supported them before. And by we, I, mean, I just mean the world. Um, and so there's a lot of tools and resources out there, online, outsourced bookkeeping services, HR services, legal services, where for a very small amount of money, you can get the right support to properly set up your business from the get-go, which kind of lowers the barriers of entry for new players entering the market. With all of your experience, it's obvious that you've learned a lot from all of that. When we come back, I want to... Um, talk to you about what are the steps after you've done the planning and you've done the research and you've, you've set it up. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Um, we're going to take that short break. This is Business in Hawaii. We'll see you back here shortly. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, your host on ThinkTech's Likeable Science Show. Every Friday at 2 p.m., we delve in the magical, magical, fascinating world of science. How science applies to your life, why you should care about science, what impact science has on you and on those around you, why you need to know some science. It's a fun, interesting, painless way to learn some good science that you can use. See you there. 
Hey, aloha everybody. Thanks for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Andrew Lanning, the security guy. I host a program called Security Matters Hawaii. And I hope you'll join us on Fridays. Uh, we air at 10 a.m. And we're gonna be talking about those security things that really should be important to you. And you know, maybe get behind the scenes on some, some things that you may not know about the industry or about products or even about your habits. Um, security is all about people, processes, and products, and we hope to bring that to you in an informative and um, hopefully a useful way. So again, 10, 10 a.m. on Fridays, Security Matters Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me. Thank you. Welcome back. This is Business in Hawaii, and today we're talking with Valerie Wang of Makai HR. So Valerie was sharing with us uh, her vast experience in starting up a business. So once you've done the planning, you've done the research, you've done the research, then you've done the planning, what next? You've launched your business. What are all the things that we need to think about? Yeah, so in the planning, part of that stage is to determine what you need to launch your business, right? And so there's a lot of pieces that come with that. What is your launch strategy? What's what's your marketing plan? Who's your how are you reaching your target customer? What's your infrastructure for servicing your customer? Um, if you're a product based business, before you launch, you probably want product in hand. Service based, you want to have your SOPs and procedures in place. So really what goes hand in hand with that is is growing your team. Um, and I think that's probably the most important part of starting your business is surrounding yourself with the right people. Mm. Um, and I think that's where where the the difference between teams that make it and companies that don't is is the team. Um, and not just the experience, right of the team and and the knowledge that they bring to the table, but also how does a team work together? So that's, why I think recruiting is so important and why there's so many businesses in that field because not just for startups but any companies, you know, who you work with is really important. And so when you launch your company, the first step is to start building your team. And with that, you have two, two decisions to make. The first is, are they partners? Are you giving them equity in your company or are you hiring them as an employee? If you hire them as an employee, you know, that goes back to why Makai HR exists, right? So now there's all of these things you have to worry about. You have to have work comp insurance. You have to have a Department of Labor number filed. You have to have your payroll set up and figure out payroll taxes and compensation plans. And now in, in Hawaii, you have to you have the Hawaii Prepaid Health Care Act and have to provide, you know, not just ACA compliant, but also prepaid compliant health care plans to your employees and track that. So. Once you decide that you want to go down the W-2 route and to hire employees to join your team, there's a number of things you have to start focusing on. Um, and you can either do that all in-house and, and maybe hire a friend or, or a consultant to help you with that, or you can look at a company like Makai HR, which is a professional employer organization whose purpose really is to handle and manage all of these pieces and components for you. Um, in that PEO co-employment model so that you, again, you're starting a business, you can focus on your business and not have to worry about the HR compliance piece. So there's PEO, um, there's something called ASO, and you could also hire a private consultant. So talk to me about what the difference is. Absolutely. So uh, PEO is professional employer organization, uh, ASO is administrative services only, and then a consultant. Um, I think it really comes down to how you want to manage your business and what resources you have internally. Um, the PEO model is a co-employment model where you actually pay your employees through the PEO's FEIN. What that does is it really allows two things. One, it allows a lot of the compliance and risk to be shared with the PEO provider. Um, because they're paying your employees through their FEIN, things like quarterly tax filings, end of year tax filings, W-2 preparation and delivery, a lot of those responsibilities fall onto the PEO. Um, and if, if it's done incorrectly, because it's being done through the PEO's FEIN, it is their responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, for small businesses especially, because you're paying your employees through their FEIN, even if you're a company of five people, you're viewed on paper as a large company. 
So when you look at some of the changes that happened with the Affordable Care Act, all of a sudden small businesses went from really nice composite banding, band ratings, which means from a benefit standpoint, everyone has the same rate, to now they're being age banded, so everyone has a different rate based off of their age and gender. Um, now, when you join a PEO, you are technically over 50 employees, and so you go back to that composite band benefit rating model. Um, so those are some of the things that make the PEO co-employment relationship unique. Um, I would say a couple years ago, it was actually a little bit of a gray area because you were paying your employees through the PEO's FEIN, so there was a lot of question on what does this mean for me as an employer? What does this mean for my employees? I'm trying to take advantage of the R&D tax credit. Can I still keep that if I'm paying my folks through your FEIN? Um, and I will say it, it was fairly gray, but in 2014, um, the Small Business Efficiency Act was signed, and then it was actually fully in, in, uh, launched in 2016. And what that act did was it, it clarified a lot of these questions around PEO and co-employment. Um, and what that act specifically addressed was the PEO now can, and it's now recognized by the IRS, file all of these taxes on behalf of their clients, but all of those tax credits and tax benefits and payroll-related benefits still live with the client, not with the PEO. So I'd say now, in 2018, the advantages of, of joining a PEO are greater than ever um, because the law has kind of clarified some of these gray areas. Um, ASO, administrative services only, does monitor a lot of the same things that a PEO does, such as payroll. They can also assist with benefits administration and workers' comp administration. But there's no co-employment relationship, so that FEIN number isn't shared. And the times it makes sense is you know, when there's a certain reason why your employees have to get payroll through their own FEIN number, whether you're a nonprofit and you have nonprofit status, or there's um, a specific contract that requires that. That's when the ASO model makes a little bit more sense. Um, the HR consultant model, which is a third third option that you mentioned, um, I believe the consultant, depending on your size, could either come in more as a project-based solution rather than a long-term ongoing solution, and they help your company get everything set up properly and launched properly. They identify an issue or a problem, and they fix it. But it's not necessarily a long-term, mm -hmm. month-to-month solution. Um, if you are looking for a consultant to be more month-to-month, -month, I think in that sense, you are looking for very hands-on support, where you don't have anyone internal to help manage and make some of these HR decisions. And in that case, you might want to hire a consultant to actually sit down and tell you what to do versus a PEO or an ASO, which is more there for guidance. Mm -hmm. So Makai HR, PEO, ASO, HR consultancy, where are you? Makai HR is a PEO. Um, so you know our bread and butter is to really live in that co-employment model. And a lot of the technology that we've put into place and a lot of the procedures and efficiencies that we've leveraged support that PEO model and our PEO clients. Um, so you've started a few businesses, you've been a small business owner, I am sure that you've had your share of failures as well as successes. So share with us some of the, the challenges that you've been through. Yeah, I, I think I could probably, how long do we have? Because I could talk <laughs> about my failures and lessons learned for hours. Um, I would say probably the biggest lesson I learned in all of my experiences, and, and I was told this as a, as a new business entrepreneur, and I didn't, I, I heard the advice and I internalized it, but I didn't really understand it. Now that I've experienced it, I understand it. But, you know, when you're raising money, and as, as a small business owner, you're just launching cash is king. If you, you're looking at payroll, you're looking at that invoice you have to pay, and if you don't have cash, you can't pay it. Um, and when you're fundraising, obviously the investors are doing their due diligence and spending a lot of time on the different opportunities and figuring out where they want to put their money. What I did not realize the importance of is, as a small business owner, it is your responsibility to interview and assess the investors just as much as they're analyzing you. Um, because all money is not the same. You want to get fundraising and funds from the right partner. 
from a partner that truly understands your business and can add more to you and your business and your, the growth of your business than just capital and just money. Um, you want to look for someone that understands your industry and can help provide other advice and other assets that you may not necessarily have. Relationships, partnerships, where they can truly contribute to your growth outside of just writing you a check. On top of that, you want to look for investors that understand your vision and their vision is aligned with your vision so that you're working in harmony towards a common goal versus you having to change your vision or the investor wanting X and Y and you want A and B. And, and that creates a lot of friction, which takes away from the end goal, which is building and growing your business. So I think the, the biggest piece of advice I learned is to spend a lot of time on, on that piece and to really look at the t who your partners are and, and not just on the fundraising and investment standpoint, but also who are your board of directors? Who are your advisors? Do you have a personal mentor to help guide you through this experience? Maybe you do, but you don't have one in the industry you're trying to get into. You should probably look for one in that industry because experience is priceless. So it sounds like you started your venture into being a business owner very early on in your career. I, you're obviously very, very young. So for our young people out there who are looking to perhaps have a business of their own and start up, what's your advice for them? I'll never forget um, this conversation I had with one of my mentors and a pretty incredible venture capitalist in, in Los Angeles. Um, he told me when he looks at different companies to invest in, the first, the only question that matters to him, yes, a business plan is nice, yes, understanding your marketing strategy is nice, but the only question that mattered to him is whether or not the founder could answer the why you, why now test. And that, that stayed with me for a really long time. Um, and what that question means is, you know, when you look at your startup business, now, you know, just go to Silicon Valley, Silicon Beach, there's hundreds of thousands of businesses starting up every single day. Um, why you? What makes you and your team so unique that no one else on this planet can replicate what you're doing? That's the first question. Because if someone else can come in, take your idea, and build it better, you've already failed that test. Second question is why now? Why, if your idea is so great, why wasn't it built five years ago or 10 years ago? Or is it too early now where maybe technology hasn't caught up yet and really your idea should be introduced five years from now when you have the technology to support it? So answering the question of why you, why now, I think was, is the advice that I was given that I'd like to pass on to other people. Um, and when I looked at, you know, Makai HR, we are also a startup. I could answer that question for this company. And that's why, you know, one of the, the reasons why I was so excited to, to join the team, because the team was really special and I could truly answer why us. Um, and then why now, you know, we are a technology driven company. There are certain technologies that we're leveraging and efficiencies that we get from that technology that wasn't available two years ago. I just talked about the Small Business Efficiency Act and how that launched in 2016. So definitely, I, I would say, focus on those two questions. I think that's great. It's very catchy, so that the young people will remember it. Anybody who wants to start a business, um, thinking about those. I want to thank you for sharing with us your experiences and the new, um, the new startup. Um, and we wish you well. Thank you. Good luck. Um, we are out of time, but thank you to Valerie for joining us today. And a big thank you to the production staff um, here in the studio. Business in Hawaii airs every Thursday at 2, and we look forward to seeing you here next week.